I want to have deep faith this year and let God talk to me more. And I'm going to be scared sometimes. I'm going to be fearful sometimes. But I've got to believe that God is calling me unto something that's greater, something that's more, and something that's deeper than I've ever experienced before. up these scriptures and, and I dig deep into God because when I rely on God, that's where the power is. And then there he go clear a path for you and what you couldn't see before, now you can move straight ahead because you've heard God's voice and God's voice will direct your path. What's good, men and women of God? How y'all doing this evening? Welcome to Fresh Start. Come on, clap your hands. Make it fresh. Make it. Make it good. Make it. Make it fresh. Make it. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Our God saves.
wanted to party just for a little bit. We just wanted to rock out for a little bit. Some of y'all been at your jobs all day. You've been sitting all day looking at computer screens and hello, welcome to Harrison Morris or whatever you work at. It's sometimes you just got to get up and ooh, slide some oil to me. We're just trying to get you in the mood. Tear your name tag off. Take your, your work jacket off and have some fun in the house of the Lord. Some people call it disrespectful to say I'm having fun in church. Fun and Jesus go hand in hand. Yeah, sometimes it's a woe is me moment. Sometimes we got to deal with some things. But when I come into the house of the Lord and I see your faces and you're smiling and you're, you're chipperish and come on, I can't help but to get excited right along with you. I'm rejoicing with those who rejoice. If you clap your hands, guess what I'm going to do with mine? If you dance your dance, guess what I'm going to do with mine? If you lift your voice, guess what I'm going to do with mine? Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. There's reason for this. I'm done. No, I'm not. Y'all know I'm not. So we're going to say, how can I forget? No, you know what? I'm going to sing a song Gr Grandma was saying back in the day. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget. No, never. That's enough. That's how we used to sing it. Today, we're how can I forget? But no matter how you sing it, do not forget the works of the Lord. Do not forget. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not his many benefits. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not what he's done for you. Yeah. Come on, Pastor Uli, let's go. Yay. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've given us. And we're bold enough to stand here and ask for even more of you. Thank you, Jesus.
Let it go. All we want is sin. Say
Who wants more of God? See, it's a, it's a loaded question because as the team was singing that song, the Holy Spirit brought back to me the verse that we founded our growth track on, which is Luke 9, 23. The way you get more of God is you have to move you out of the way. See, we can sing a song and it's easy to get up here and sing the song, God, I want more and more and more, but then I don't want to give you any space to operate. When I, when I see tragedies like what happened yesterday, God, we want you to move, but I won't give you any room to move. Luke 9, 23 says, if any man wants to follow me, to be my disciple, they must deny themselves and pick up their cross daily, which means that, God, I, I woke up with what I thought I wanted to do, but I'm going to put that down, and I'm going to listen to you. What would you have me to do? Where would you have me to be? Where would you have me to go? So you may have walked in. This is our miracle moment. You may have walked in tonight, and you're carrying something. You're saying, God, I need you to move in this area. God, I need you to move in my marriage. I need you to move in my finances. I need you to move with my children. Whatever that is, if that's you, raise your hand. Then I'm going to have you raise your other hand as a surrender and say, God, I'm getting out of the way. I'm making room for you to operate. I'm going to turn off my logic. I'm going to turn off my brain. I'm going to turn off my thinking of what I think I should do I'm going to allow you to speak in as we pray. If your hand's not up and you're near somebody, you can put your hand on their shoulder. We're linking up right now. We're going before the Lord. Lord, we want more of you. Lord, we want to apply your word, Lord God. Your word has not changed, Lord God. You have spoken to every aspect of, your, of our lives through your word, Lord God. Right now, Lord God, we, we put that into our faith, Lord God. We link together and we build our faith, Lord God. The strength of a miracle moment, Lord God, is not in the words that I'm saying, Lord God, but it's in your words, Lord God, and we command them right now, Lord God. You are the healer, Lord God. You are the provider, Lord God. You are the deliverer, Lord God. Those persons that are lost right now, those that are looking for answers, Lord God, those that are, are crying out on social media, Lord God, those that are at home right now on YouTube and Facebook and whatever, and they're watching, looking for an answer, Lord God, I know you're the God that is the answer. The answer has always been you, Lord God, and we surrender right now, Lord God. We draw in closer, and we get quiet, Lord God. Instead of telling you the problem, we're going to listen, Lord God, to your answer. The world doesn't need more laws and legislation. They need more God. They need more Jesus. They need more of your love. They need more of your direction, Lord God. Lord God, we as your church need to be that light. We need to allow you to, to flow through us, Lord God, to be the conduits of your love, Lord God, of your wisdom, Lord God, in every aspect of our lane, Lord God. We are tired of sitting back. It's time for us to rise up and to stand forward and to take our place, Lord God, in our communities, at our jobs, in our families, Lord God, and allow you to speak, Lord God. That is where the more comes from. We have too much of our flesh. We have too much of our ideals, Lord God. We need more spirit leading. We need more of your Holy Spirit leading and guiding us, and we need to get out of the way. Lord, we get out of the way right now, and we get in closer with you. Let's continue to worship, church. Jesus. 
Verse, draw me close to you. Everybody sing. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. Never let me go. Lay it all down. Lay it all down again. To hear you say that I'm your friend. To hear you say.
church, don't let that just be a saying. Etch that on your heart. Let that be your, your statement that you walk through the week. Lord, you're all I need. I don't need mama's advice. I don't need daddy's advice. Lord, all I need is you. I don't need the bottle. I don't need the weed. I don't need the smoke. Yeah. I don't need this. Lord, you're all I need. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Are you happy to be here tonight, church? Yeah. Amen. Happy Fresh Start Wednesday. We are so glad to see you. Before you sit down, greet your neighbor. Tell them how glad you are to see them. Give them a high five, a fist pump, whatever you feel comfortable with. If you are online, we count it such an honor that you are tuning in tonight. You are in for a treat. We want to connect with you. Go ahead and click the link in the, the comment section. That way we can connect with you, answer any questions that you have. If you're here in the building and this is your first time, we are so excited. Don't leave out of here without stopping by one of the welcome counters. We have some gifts for you. We want to just shake your hand. We don't want to do anything weird. We just want to tell you how glad we are to see you and answer any questions that you have for the ministry. Amen. Church, let's show them how much we appreciate them. Awesome. So you know what season that we are in right now. We are in getting ready for our next neighborhood group um, semester coming up. It's our summer session, which is the most fun session because it's only six weeks long. So right now we are looking for people who are willing to let God use them and lead a group. Now I want to tell you, leading a group is not hard. It's doing what you already do in your life. And we will show you how to turn that into a tool for God. So if you like to go hunting, we're going to show you how to do it. If you like to go fishing, we're going to show you. If you like to go sit and eat, we can show you. If you want to go and pray, we're going to show you how to turn that. It's just opening up your life and sharing it so somebody can do it with you. Don't make it bigger than it is. It's only six weeks. It's a great experience. People are a little nervous, then they jump in there, and they just step out, and they watch how God shows up. And it's just showing people that, hey, I'm normal. I do normal things. Would you like to do some normal things with me? Amen. So if you want to go on the website, go to the um, Get Connected page, and you'll see Neighborhood groups and it says lead a group click on that if you have any questions stop by the welcome counters and our team will be able to answer any questions for you also this is our last sunday with the three service times we are switching june 5th we go to services at 9 and 11 o'clock so this is our last sunday we're doing it three so just get it you know just go we're gonna say farewell to all three so you're gonna have to pick out new seats if you're used to a certain place you're gonna meet new friends so circle your calendar you don't want to get those times missed up but this sunday there's going to be something special pastor Diego is going to be ministering on healing this Sunday. So if you know somebody that's been dealing, if you yourself has been dealing with something, you don't want to miss this Sunday. You want to make sure that you're here. We're gonna, it's gonna be a powerful service. Every time we have a healing service, it's powerful. If you're listening to me online, you find a way to come into this building, be there, invite somebody, don't go alone. If you if somebody that you see struggling, be like, hey, we are having a service on healing. Come and hear what God has to say about healing. Bring them with you this Sunday. You don't want to miss out. Let's prepare our hearts for our generosity moment. Hey family, here we are for our generosity moment, but more than that, we're preparing our hearts for ALFC's Anniversary Vision Sunday. Amongst all campuses, we'll be sowing a one-time seed to go to three projects. The first one is a campus improvement co project at each campus, they have their own unique campus improvement project. The second thing we'll be doing is giving towards an orphanage in another country, which we'll be sharing about next week. And then lastly, we're here to tell you about the next ALFC campus happening specifically in the city of Norco. We are blessed that we will be putting an Abundant Living Family Church location in the Norco Men's Prison, the California Rehabilitation Center. Every single week, we will have church here right behind me at the California Rehabilitation Center starting this summer. Every single week when we preach, they will have praise and worship in the California Rehabilitation Center. They will have a message every single weekend. It is one of our church campuses. So now we have ALFC Norco slash California Rehabilitation Center, Men's Norco Prison. We are so blessed about the opportunity that these men behind us will have an opportunity to hear the gospel and grow in faith. And normally what is a desperate time and normally what's a desolate time, uh, we will be putting an Abundant Living Family Church here right behind me. So family, 
As we say, this is the time that we believe in campuses, whether we're putting a campus in a city or in a prison, we know that God can do great things. And so your seed that you're gonna sow, you could get with your family or pray with yourself and say, God, what is it that guy can do on June 5th at any of my campuses, whether you're online in Rancho or in Pomona, this is an opportunity that we say, God, we wanna see our money, our seed go further than ever before. And this is a special time. We were gonna actually announce a different city, but God opened up the doors for us to put a church here in California Rehabilitation Center in Norco. And we said, absolutely yes. So would you partner with us so that we can financially steward this next move of God that God has called us to? So June 5th, make sure no matter what service you go to or what location you go to, pray with your family. What one-time seed can we give to the church to see God do more for the gospel. Family, we're so excited. This is something to celebrate. Now we have ALFC Rancho, ALFC Pomona, and ALFC CRC. We are so excited about God's move in our church. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. We can't wait for this special moment launching this, launching this summer. All right. That's pretty exciting for us. We didn't see that uh, opportunity coming our way, but they came to us and asked us, will we take over an existing church in the prison? And uh, we're just so grateful and honored that that uh, opportunity was given to us. So we're going to jump aboard, and uh, it'll just launch a whole nother uh, congregation, a whole lot of level of ministry. And so many people, as we come back from COVID, so many people have asked me, are we going to the streets again? Are we doing homeless again? Are we going to the prisons? Well, now your answer is here. Yes, here's another opportunity. And again... Uh, we, we, um, we hold the integrity of, our, of how we do our offerings and our finances very close to our hearts. And uh, that's why we just, every week, just do the generosity moment. And we never, ever ask for a second offering. We never do anything like that. Um, only once a year at our anniversary do we ask for the extra. And the extra allows us to do extra that the normal tithe and offering does not normally do. And so, again, we're distributing in three amazing areas. And I just want to thank you ahead of time um, for your generosity. You truly are making a difference in building the kingdom of God. And uh, I want to thank you for that. Well, it's my privilege to introduce to you. Oh, and again, the healing service is going to be amazing. So um, oftentimes we do it on an off service. But, you know, the majority of people are not only in the building but watching online on the weekend. So we're going to do a a healing service as we are in our series that we are in, and you're going to see uh, the, the Chosen, right? I almost forget. The Chosen. You're going to see the movie, little movie clip of The Chosen and see Jesus do a healing, and that will launch uh, the message, and it will be really great. Well, my, one of my dearest friends is with us, and he comes our way uh, once a year, and I usually bring him uh, in for our commencement as our speaker for our leadership university. And I don't know if there's any LU alumni or LU graduates that are here today. And we had an amazing graduation. I think it was the best ever. Uh, and uh, he did a masterful job on how to resolve conflict, how you face conflict, how you navigate through conflict. Um, Pastor Steve uh, pastors really now all over New Mexico. He has the largest church in all of New Mexico. There's like six or seven locations all over New Mexico. And um, he very, very much is a gifted communicator. We share always so many things in common. His wife's name is Cynthia. My wife's name is Cynthia. We've been married about the same time. Uh, we're the same exact age. It's just uh, I look a little older. He looks a little younger. Uh, but you know what? Here's a whole other thing that I'm introducing him to. I'm introducing him to the kick world because when I met him, he looked like a country boy from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I just said, dude, you got to up your game now. And so, so he, he'd been up in his game. And so today I bought him his first pair of J's. He bought his first pair of Jordans, but he's too shy to wear them. He brought those ugly shoes. No, I'm just kidding. You guys are just going to be extremely blessed. I don't know of a pastor who has a love for his people and a love for the flock and a love to help uh, people. 
And uh, I just want you to stand on your feet and give Pastor Steve Smotherman, all the way from Albuquerque, New Mexico, come on, a big, abundant, lifting, warm welcome. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you, guys. Man, praise God. Let's just thank God one time, can we? What gr Great worship, but anyway, you may be seated. Thank you so much. <laughs> Pastor Diego has me laughing. I should just start off by saying, hey, y'all, since I'm a country bumpkin from Albuquerque, um, but <laughs> I, now I'm up here with my ugly shoes. Now that's what I'm thinking about, you know. Um, but anyway, it's an honor to be here. You, you know, I, I told Pastor Diego this yesterday. I said, you know, you realize, Pastor Diego, you have one of the greatest churches in all of America. Seriously. And um, I'm not just saying that because he's my friend. I'm just, I, I believe that. I think, and I told him, I said, you're one of the greatest pastors in all of America. And, uh, and, and he can't say that to you, but I can. Uh, because really, guys, you, you, you don't realize how well known he is. Um, you, you just come to church here, but your church is known all over the country, and, and Pastor Diego is one of the greatest pastors I know in America today, and so thank you, and I, and I appreciate him letting me come and, and mess up a little bit so he can come back and fix it, you know, since I'm just a country guy that knows nothing and ugly shoes, and so, but I will wear the shoes he bought me in, in Albuquerque, and they'll think I'm cool. I'm not as cool as your pastor, that's for sure. And, uh, but I'm working on it, I'm trying, you know, it just takes a while to get there. But listen, today I want to talk about a, a topic that I think is, is, needs to be talked about more in the body of Christ. And I just simply titled this message, Spiritual Warfare. Amen. And I'm going to talk to you tonight about how God always has a strategy for us to win. Amen. He always has a strategy for us to conquer, to not just survive things, but to become more than conquerors. And even though his methods may seem uncommon to us, the truth is, is that he knows everything. You and I don't know what's going to happen 20 seconds from now. Let me, let me put, we don't know what's going to happen five seconds from now. In five seconds, there could be an earthquake and this thing could fall down. Who knows? God knows. And in spiritual warfare, he teaches us to fight. And he gave us the word of God, which is eternal, which is quick and alive and powerful. And if you listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, I'm going to read it from the King James and the New Living Translation. The Bible says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Out of the New Living, it reads, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. The Bible talks about that our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So what does that mean? That means when we're in this world and we're fighting, we're not fighting with physical fights. We're not, we're not trying to punch people. We're not trying to hurt people that way. The only way we can win in this world is to fight the way God said, because he said our fight is not with flesh and blood. In other words, boys, you can't, you can't get a gun, a sword, a, a fist. Nothing can, 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 can help you fight your enemy that way. The only thing that can help you is the Word of God because it's eternal and it's quick and alive and powerful. And it's the only thing that God gave us to say, you want to be a conqueror? You better do the Word. You want to you wanna win? You better do the Word. It's the only way we, we thwart off the, the attacks of our enemy, which is the devil. And today, people don't even want to bring up his name. When I first got saved, I'll never forget this. When I first got saved in the charismatic renewal, Preachers used to come to the church, and even the preacher I had, they said, man, don't talk about the devil. If you talk about the devil, he's going to get you. Just leave him alone, and he'll leave you alone, which is a lie. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What he wants people to believe is that he doesn't even exist. But we have an enemy, and, and we have this book called the Bible, which is the eternal word of God, which is forever settled. Heaven and earth will pass away, but this word will never pass away. When God spoke it, it was for the ages, for all time, for eternity. 
And he says, your weapons are not carnal. So we try to fight things with reasoning. I say this all the time. You know, Phil, uh, Dr. Phil and Oprah aren't going to give you the advice you need to win and conquer the demons that we deal with in our lives. But that's where we want. We want to go take all the, 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 thing, the, the thoughts of the world where that doesn't whoop the devil. What, what whoops the devil is the word of God. And we have to learn to walk in it and do what God says. Now, when the Bible says weapons, these are spiritual weapons. They have been provided by God for us to use. They are both offensive and defensive weapons and can be found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 18. So if you want to turn in your Bibles, if you have them, I'm going to read some of that. And I, I just believe that, that it tells us how to fight and who we're fighting. Ephesians chapter 6, actually I'm going to start in verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Our enemy is not your neighbor or not Joe or Susie that did me wrong. Right. Or an ex-husband or uh, an ex-friend or whatever. For the we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. These are demonic hierarchies, demonic places it's 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 their rankings if you would that's who we fight against how do you know we fight against them because i just read it <laughs> against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places therefore put on every piece of god's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil then after the battle you will still be standing firm stand your ground putting on the belt of truth and the the, and the body of, of armor of God's righteousness for shoes put on the peace that comes from good news so that you will be uh, fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the what? Wicked one. Of the, or, the, or the devil, either one, the translations. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit. At all times and on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Yeah. And so the Bible gives us our weapons. They're not natural weapons. I don't put on, I'm not putting on a, 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 an armor like the knights did in, you know, when, in, in the, the, back in the old days. I, I don't have that kind of armor. My armor is unseen, yeah. but it's real nonetheless. Yeah. And he says, this is how we fight. Some of us are trying to fight naturally. But you can't beat the enemy naturally. Because our fight is not with flesh and blood. It's not a natural fight. It's a spiritual fight. And God's given us all the weapons to win. And so we need, I mean, aren't we, don't we want to come to church and be different? Don't we want to come to church and say, man, I feel better. I feel different. Man, something lifted off me, a heaviness, a weight. Because that's what God wants us to do. But this is how we fight. And so we have these weapons. The word warfare is stratos, which means strategy. Uh -huh. So this does not occur accidentally, but is something that is strategically planned. It's no different than if an army is going to war, they have to have a strategy to win. Amen. If we are fighting enemies that are not flesh and blood, we better go to our general, uh -huh. our Lord and Savior, and find out how we win and conquer these enemies that come to steal, kill, and destroy. All of us have to do that. The word stratos doesn't just describe the devil's strategies. It also lets us know that the Holy Spirit will give us a strategy that is better, greater, better than the devil's. The Holy Spirit working in our lives will give us a strategy for victory, to win to have abundant life. And so we, we have this ability that God's given us. It's a divinely inspired strategy. God from the beginning have been giving his children strategies to win. Look at Joshua at Jericho. Joshua took, out, uh, you know, took over after Moses and he was mourning Moses and I love the way God talks. He said, Joshua, just stop. Stop mourning. He's dead. He's gone. Now you got to get, get yourself up, boy, and start moving. 
I mean, that's what God says, because God said, you gotta stop doing this. And then he tells them, we're gonna go to the promised land, we're gonna go to Jericho. Jericho's the first city. You're gonna, you're gonna overcome that. You're gonna, you're gonna take it over. And so God begins to give Joshua a strategy. It's uncommon, but it's God's ways of winning, of helping him to conquer. So what happened was he sent some spies into Jericho, and then they met Rahab, who's the prostitute. And so they begin, she begins to tell them, We're, these, these people are afraid. They're fearful. They've heard what you've done. They heard that God parted the Red Sea and you went over dry land, that you defeated your enemies. They were terrified of them. So here's the strategy God gave them, and it's no different than how he gives us strategies today. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to have the priests go and your army, and I want you to march around the city for six days. But I don't want the people to say a word. Now, here's what we do today, just like they probably did then, like, what? See, if you're having financial issues in here, God has a strategy for you to overcome. Yeah. But it all starts with the tithe. Uh -huh. This is where it starts. It seems weird, like, I'm not going to give God, I'm not going to give the church all my money. The church doesn't want all your money. Right, right. But if you want to have financial success, real financial success, yeah. where you don't have to, like, I, I, you know, I built this business, but I lost my whole family. If you want to have some peace in your life, then you have to do it God's way. So God gives them a strategy and says, on the seventh day, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna march around seven times. Don't Tell the people don't say a word. But when they hear the horns blow, they are to shout, and the walls are gonna come down, and you're gonna conquer this whole city. Now, how many of y'all know that strategy does not sound sound? It doesn't sound sound. It doesn't like, what? You want me to do what? What are we gonna do, boy? You're gonna march, but don't talk. Now that for some of us, that we would be out then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, shh. And so, so that's what he tells them to do. And what does God do? The walls come down and he kills them all. They were already terrified of them. And so we need to understand that God gives strategies. Look at Gideon in Judges. Gideon is hiding and he's threshing wheat. And some people have said this, I've heard it said by different preachers and different people, that Gideon was a coward. Let me tell you something. I don't think Gideon was a coward at all. I think he was the opposite of a coward. They said, why was he hiding? Because they, these folks, the Midianites, would come because the, the children of Israel were disobedient. For seven years, the Midianites reigned over them. And every time they planted crops or had goats or sheep or whatever, the Midianites would come and take everything and leave them to starve. So Gideon is threshing wheat in a secret place, hiding from the Mennonites so people could have food to eat. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him. He didn't even know who it was. That's why the, the, the Bible talks about beware lest you entertain strangers unaware because ain't, we don't know. So he didn't even know who he was. And the guy's sitting under this tree and says, hey, mighty hero, one translation, mighty man of valor. And he's looking like, who, me? I'm the least of the... Uh, I'm, I'm from the least tribe. I'm the least in my father's house. And then, and then he says, the Lord is going to help you, basically. And Gideon says, if he's a coward, he wouldn't have said this. He said, where has the Lord been? He abandoned us. Where has he been all this time? For seven years we've been in this. And the Lord heard their cry. The Lord will always hear our cry when we cry out. But they were in bondage because of their sin. So Gideon gets up, and he begins to say, what do you want me to do? And then he puts out some fleeces and all that. And then he gets up one night, gets some guys, and he tears down all the, the, the statues of Baal and the Asherah poles. He destroys them. The people get up and see them destroyed, and they want to kill him. They tell Joash, his dad said, send him out there. We'd kill him if Gideon did this. And then Joash, the dad said, are you serious? You're going to worship Baal? You're going to put Baal over God? And then they backed off. And then God says, Gideon, you need an army. Now, the people here were going to fight were the Midianites, the Amalekites, and, and the armies of the east. Most people believe there was 120 to 150,000 men. So he calls his men 32,000. And then God says, Gideon, you have too many. Like, what? Think of the strategy. Gideon, you have too many because God's strategy is always that he gets the credit and the glory. 
What we do is we intellectualize the scriptures so that we get the credit. Look what I've done. I have people say, man, I prayed. 20 people got saved. No, no. You didn't get, I, I, I got 20 people saved. You didn't get anybody saved. You preach the gospel. It's God that deals with hearts and minds. We, we cast the net, but it's God who saves them. You, we can't save anybody. So Gideon looks and says he got 32,000 men. God said, you have too many. So you can imagine Gideon like, what? And God said, tell everybody who's timid and afraid to leave. So I can imagine if I'm Gideon, I'm thinking, well, God, there's nobody going to leave because they're all ready to fight. 22,000 go home. Now you go from 32 to 10. You know the army you're going to fight is so many. They said it's like, the, it's like the grain of the sand. It was too many to count. So they believe it was 100 to 150,000, 120 ish in, in their men that they were gonna fight. So now they have 10. And God said, You still have too many. He's like, What? He says, Gideon, listen, here's what I'm gonna do for you. You're gonna defeat the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the armies of the East like you're fighting one man. That's what God's promise. But you have to do it His way if you want His results. So God said, You have too many. But God, I only have 10,000. He said, but you have too many. Take them and have them drink and watch them drink. And all those who put their face in the water, send them home. And all those who drink like this, keeping a watch. He said, you keep them. So I can imagine Gideon said, no problem. So he goes there and he sends home 9,700 of the 10,000. Because they were brave, but they were not wise. Because the wise ones know there's a fight. I'm going to drink, but they ain't going to kill me while I'm drinking. I'm going to keep watch. And we're called to keep watch in our own lives and, and people around us. We're called. So God says, now you got the army. Can you imagine Gideon like, what? I can imagine if it was me, I'd be like, what the heck, Lord? What, what are we doing here? 300 guys against 120,000? He said, if you'll do it my way. You'll win. And this is what I want to say in spiritual warfare. If we do it his way, we'll always win. When you do it your way or what you think or my friend said, my mother said, my, somebody else said, my boss said. When you use what other people say and don't do it God's way, you'll never have God results. And how do you defeat the enemy when you're not willing to use the word of God? You can't beat the, de defeat the enemy by intellectualizing the gospel. And so Gideon goes, and then God says, here's what we're going to do, Gideon. You're going to separate these 300 into three groups of 100. And you're going to put in their hands a jar of clay, a clay jar. And they're going to have a torch. And, and, and that's what they're going to fight with, and a horn. So Gideon's like, okay, so he sets them up, 100 over here, 100 over here, 100 here. And even in the light, it's, it's, it talks about how they put a covering over it so it wouldn't splash everywhere. It would just be a light. And so this is what we're going to go fight with. Remember what God told him? Gideon, listen. It'll be like you're fighting one man. So he goes. The Amalekites, the Midianites, and the armies of the east did not know each other. They just gathered together to defeat Israel, to defeat these folks. So Gideon takes the three of them, and they go out at the middle of the night, they do this, and then they, he says, when I break the jar, you blow the trumpet, and let's see what happens. That's the strategy. He did, it doesn't even say they had a sword in their hand. So we're going to go fight, and what, what am I fighting with? A clay jar, a torch, and a horn. <laughs> if it was me, I'd be like, I'm going to go with the 9700. That, this strategy does not make any sense to me. It's so uncommon, but here's what we need to know. God knows everything. And here's what God said. God said, listen, I want to make sure that everybody in here knows who did what. Because unless God gets the glory, we think we did something. That's why in salvation, it's not about our works. Now, when you get saved... You're called to do works. But you can't do anything, deserve it, earn it. Salvation, it's a gift you have to receive. 
So Gideon does what he says. The jar breaks, the horn blows, and the Midianites and the Amalekites and the armies of these, they freak out. They don't know who's who. It's the middle of the night, and they begin, they begin to kill each other. In fact, God, to give Gideon some courage, says, Gideon, you and so-and-so, you and another guy, you go and you listen to what they're saying. And this one guy said, I had a dream. I had a dream that this, this thing came down and rolled up. And, 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 and Gideon's like, uh-oh, he had a dream that they're going to get destroyed. So it encouraged Gideon. So Gideon comes out. They do it. The armies kill each other. And then some of them start running. And then those 9,700 he sent home, they're now fighting. They're like, we're going to go kill them all. And he says, we're going to kill everybody. And I love Gideon. Gideon was never a coward. He was the bravest of brave. Yeah. And I love what he did. He went to this one town and said, hey, man, would you feed us? We're hungry. And they said, no, nope, we won't until you get the kings. And then I love what Gideon said. Good, because after we kill those kings, I'm going to come back and kill every one of you. He was no coward. He was a strong man. But here's what he did. He had a strategy from God. And that strategy helped him to overcome the enemy and to help set everybody free. So God always has a strategy for us. And, and then when, and God will lead you to victory. And so God always has a strategy if we would believe him and do what he asks. It's the only way to true victory. So you want a strategy in your finances? You have to tithe. Quit listening to these crazy people that say, oh, tithing's the only Old Testament. Tithing has been around from the beginning to the end. In fact, Jericho was the tithe when they went into the promised land. So God said, so people say, well, I can't afford to tithe. The, the truth is we cannot not afford to tithe. If you want victory in your finances, I don't know how many people I've had over the years said, Pastor, I know I've been coming here for years. I finally started tithing, or my wife talked me into tithing, and, and we never had enough. We were living paycheck to paycheck. And I had this guy just tell me this recently, and he goes, can I tell you? She convinced me to tithe. I started tithing. We have money in the bank now. And I said, what happened? He said, I don't know. Can I tell you what happened? God came in and you defeated the enemy of poverty. Because that's your enemy. That's a spirit. You know, poverty is a spirit. And it wants to keep you down. Because the oppressed always vote in their oppressors. Because of the victim mentality. We got to get delivered from that. And the only way to get delivered from the victim mentality, oh, woe with me, is to get in the word of God and start acting on it and realize you've been made more than a conqueror. And then he says, pray in the spirit. Folks, we need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. We need to pray in other tongues. How do you pray in the spirit? People, and, and, and you know what's so funny is people try to discount the scriptures. They go through the Bible and they say all the time, well, that's not for today. And this is not for today. And this is not for today. Listen, if any part of this is not for the day, then I don't need it. Why do I need this if I pick and choose? If like a buffet, like, no, I'm not going to eat that. No, I'll eat that. No, this is for today and that's for tomorrow. And so even, even some denominations will say, oh, being filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, that, that was back then. We don't need it today. Listen, do we think our world's any better than it was back then? People say all the time, this is the worst the world's ever been. I don't believe it one bit. This is the only world we know, so that's why we think that. But I can guarantee you, Noah's day, it was worse than this day. In fact, it was so bad, God said, I'm killing everybody. I'm going to start over. These people are never going to repent. And just remember when they say, well, if God was so kind and loving, why did he kill all these people? Because these people were never going to repent. And they were going to hurt his family and his children forever. That's why he killed the Egyptians. Think about Moses. Think about the strategy God gave Moses. Moses, go tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. And by the way, the, the Charlton Heston Moses is the only real Moses. This new Moses they came out with that has an English accent, here's what I guarantee you. Moses did not have an English accent. And he was kind of feminine. He was like a sissy. Child has was like, let my people go. That English dude was like, hey, if you don't mind, Pharaoh, would you please let us go? I mean, like, now we're going to fight. Now we need some flesh and blood fighting. Like, stop it. And so God leads him to the Red Sea. He could have taken him a whole different way. And that's where the people wanted to go. We always want to go the way we think is the easiest. Because it's easy to ignore this. So what does he do? He takes them to the Red Sea. What do they do? What are you doing? We're stuck. And then they, they think, it can't get any worse. Why are we here? We can't get across. And they say, it can't get any worse. And then they say, what are we hearing? And there's Pharaoh's army. And now it can't get worse. 
And then what do they start doing? Remember victim, remember poverty. They say, oh, you left us here to die. We should have stayed in Egypt. They'd rather stay in bondage than to do what it takes to get free. And that's the truth with a lot of Christians. We can get free. Listen, if you're still praying about the same thing you were praying about 20 years ago, something's wrong. I go, to, I go to Roswell where my brother pastors and I pastor there and there's still people there that come up to me when I'm preaching and will have me pray and I'm like, I'm praying for the same thing I prayed 27 years ago. Why is that? Because they don't believe this enough to do it. They just want to borrow everybody else's faith instead of growing their own faith and saying, I'm going to get my mind free. I'm going to get my body free. These, these evil things that are trying to harass me, generational things that try to work me, uh-uh, we're going to fight those. We're going to break that crud off our families. Yeah. And if and my parents didn't do it, I'll do it. Yeah. And that's what God wants us to do. Yeah. And so we, Moses is up. He's at the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army's there. They're like, you should have just left us to die. And God told Moses, Moses, quit whining. Put your staff out there. And God parted the Red Sea. Yeah. And when he parted the Red Sea, the Bible teaches, and, and, and it says they walked on dry land, but the Hamash teaches that they not only walked on dry land, but it was grass, it was nice. So they walk across, and they're standing on the other side, and Pharaoh thinks, well, you know what? I, if they did it, I can do it. So Pharaoh gets his army because he's so enraged about killing, or, or really, he didn't want to kill him. He wanted to bring him back in to be slaves. So he goes in there, and what does the Lord let the people do? He lets them see his deliverance. That their enemy, that God's strategy was the right strategy. Because if he had taken them around another way, the Egyptians would have harassed them and been after them. Their whole, they'd have been afraid their whole lives. Because you figure they've been slaves for 400 years. That's all they could think of. So God had to bring a guy like Moses, think about it, who was a free man to help them have a free mentality. And he could never do it. I mean, he could never do it. At one time, God says, I'm killing them all, Moses. They're I'm tired of these folks. And Moses said, you can't do that, God. If you do that, what will people, what will people say? And then later on, Moses says, God, please kill every one of them. <laughs> and then God's like, no, nah, Moses, we can't do that. We both, I'm glad they didn't agree at the same time. But God let him see his deliverance and said, see, if you listen to my strategy, I know and I see down the road, you'll never have to be afraid of Pharaoh and your captors ever again. Never. But here's what we'll say, but I'd rather go this way because it's easier. You mean now I got to tithe? Yeah, you got to tithe. You want, you want God's blessing in your life? You better tithe. You want, you want to know how to pray? You got to get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's a strategy. That's a strategy that God has for all of us. I thank God I was filled with the Holy Spirit when I first got saved because it changed my life. And when people say speaking in tongues is not for today, it's like, how, how, how dumb do we have to be to believe that? He said, I, I don't believe that. Well, why? well, good, because we shouldn't. One scripture in 1 Corinthians 13 talks about this will pass away, that will pass away, that will pass away, wisdom, love, all these things, wisdom will pass away, knowledge will pass away. And then when God comes, we won't need to speak in other tongues. But the only one they pick out that's done for today is the one that they cannot bring to their understanding and understand. They can't intellectualize that. So what do they do? They discount it. God's not a healer today. Pastor Diego's talking about we're gonna have, you're going to have healing services here. Bring the sick. Come expecting. Tell them God's going to heal you. People say, well, healing's not for today. Are we, are we healthier? Are we, is there anybody not sick? In, I mean, has anybody ever not been sick in here? I don't know about you, but we need God's power greater than we ever do. You want healing? Get in the Word of God. When you're taking your medicine, take the medicine of the Word. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. God sent His Word and healed me and delivered me from all destruction. That's God's strategy. God has a strategy for everything in our lives to win. You want, a, you want a strategy to help your marriage? Then listen to what the Bible says. Think about it. The Bible says when you get married, your body's not your own. So I tell my wife, you know, people say, do you have a feminine side? Yes, her name is Cynthia. And I get in touch with her as often as I can. That's the only feminine side I have. 
Because what has the world been trying to do for about 30 years is make men effeminate. Yeah. You're right. And I love this church because you got some men here. You got some big, tough dudes here. Yeah. All you got to know is, no, nah, I'm not going to take a shot at the title. But, but that's one thing great about your pastors. He knows when he reaches men, he reaches the whole family. Yeah. So here's the strategy. You ready? That your body's not your own. You know the only time that God really talks about the devil will enter in immediately into marriage is when you're not being intimate with each other. He said, go away for praying and fasting for a short time and then come back immediately together and let the devil enter in. So, wives, you know what? You shouldn't say no. And men, you should bathe before you... <laughs> you might think it's cool, like, hey, baby, I just came from outside sweating and she's like, oh, no, gag me, uh-uh. You go bathe, boy. You go bathe my body. Get it ready. See, we don't want to hear, but that, that's a strategy. <laughs> and, I, and I'll be honest with you. Out of all God's strategies, I like that one the best. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Pastor. Dear. But it's a strategy. Husbands, love your wives as Christ of the church. Women, respect your husbands. You know, the Bible says in Genesis that the wife will try to overcome and conquer the man. But then the Bible says the man will just crush her. So what do we have today? Women that are always trying to be the boss. Always wanting to do this. And then the man finally gets enough and says, woman, you better stop. Because here's what I know about us men. Sometimes we're just afraid of our wives. Come on, men. Just help me out. Raise your hand. Come on. Ain't nobody raising their hand in here. Pastor Diego. Yeah, you guys are going to be in trouble. Your wife's going to say, you're not afraid of me? Well, here we go. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, anything that is of the flesh or fleshly made or fleshly conjured up or anything that is as natural or of an unspiritual nature, he said, those aren't your weapons. Our weapons are spiritual. This is spiritual. This is power. And when we act on it, it doesn't matter what area it is. If you want to change your thinking, you're dealing with depression all the time, you got to change the way you think. So think on these things. The Bible even tells us what to think of. That's a strategy. Is it work? That's the problem. People want, people want God to be like McDonald's, you know, just drive through and get it. You know, it's so funny. When you go sit in a restaurant, you're pretty cool with visiting and waiting on food. You go to McDonald's, and how many of you are like me? I hate to hear this when I go to the window and pick up my food. Sir, would you pull up? <laughs> I've actually changed my order. I'm like, okay, what's the hold up? Well, it's that filet of fish you want. Okay, I'll change it to a hamburger. Just, I, please don't send me to pull up. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? See, it's, we don't want, it's like, I ain't got, please, I'll, I'll change whatever, but don't, please don't make me go up there and wait. I hate it. I'm like, I'm leaving. I don't want to wait. But on God, we need to wait on God because he knows down the street, around the corner, he knows next year, he knows five years, and he says, listen, if you'll operate my strategies now, in five years from now, you'll be a whole lot better, or a year from now, or three months from now, or how about a day from now? God has a strategy. You think about it, God has a strategy. He has a strategy for raising our kids, and one of them is we're not raising our kids. We're training our kids. That's the problem in America today. When I was a kid, when my parents said be quiet, we were quiet. When they had friends over, we were not to be seen. Today, we have, we have parents negotiating with five-year-olds. Can I tell you how I negotiated my five-year-old? You better do what I tell you to do right now. Well, they'll cry. No, they won't. They'll cry about two seconds, and then I'll give them something to cry about, and then they'll stop. You know why? Because we've missed it. We use the scripture and say, God says raise. He never said raise. He said train. You got to train them. And how many of y'all know training is rugged? I started working out a few years ago, and I hate it. I like the results. I like when I'm done. But man, getting in the gym is like, oh, here we go, man. Because I know it's going to hurt. Because it's training. We train our children in the way they should go, not raise them. We train. That's God's strategy. Too many parents are trying to be their five-year-old's friend. 
Instead of looking, I, 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 I tell my wife, we walk through stores, I see kids flopping around and throwing fits. I said, Cindy, if they would give me that kid for 10 minutes, he would never, ever do that again. I whoop his little butt like it never been whooped. People say, oh, that's against the law. No, it's not. Not in my Bible. God says train them. That means they don't get a lot of options. We tell them what to do. You're going to eat that food. Why? Because I cooked it. I don't like it. I don't care if you don't like it. You're going to, what we're training them to is to obey us. And when you raise them to be their friend, now there's a time when our kids become our friends. When my kids became 18, they can go do what they want. I'm dad when they need me to be dad. Other than that, I'm their friend. I've already trained them. It's too late to do anything else. And see, that's a strategy. And I don't even know I'm talking about that strategy because that's not in my notes. That's for somebody in here. We can't do it the world's way. We've got to do it God's way. That's why we're losing our kids. So if you're a 15-year-old, I don't, when my 15-year-old, I try to get them to go to church, they throw a fit. Have them sit their butts right in that chair and pout in front of everybody. You say, what? In my house? In my house? My kids knew. You lived in my house, you go to church. And my 18-year-old little, my youngest daughter, when she became 18, she moved out. Do you know why she moved out? Because she knew if she lived here, she'd have to go to church. She didn't want to go to church. And you know what I let her do? Move out. No, no compromise. This is my house. This is the way we live. Not because we're preachers, but because we're believers. See, we've got to hold tight because that's the only way we get them back. You train them. That's a strategy. You give. That's a strategy. You want the blessing of God on your life? You got to do what he says. And then when you resist the enemy, he will flee. How do you resist him? Not intellectually, spiritually. With the word of God. I'm standing on the promises of God. I'm doing what God says. And, And that's how it works. We could read this scripture this way, and I close. Our God-given weapons are to be used in connection with divine strategies. But don't look to the flesh to find that strategy. For that battle plan you need is not going to arise out of your own natural talent, mental exercise, or human effort. It comes from things we don't get. Like, God, you say, if I give, I'll receive? Yes. You don't have because you're not sowing. It doesn't matter what area it's in. You have an anger problem? God has an answer for that. Whatever issue, you have an addiction problem? God has the power to deliver you, free you, help you if you'll do what he says. You got to fight. And it's work, and that's where we don't want. We just want it. God, if you, you love me, you'll just take care of it. And God says, no, I've already taken care of it. You're going to have to do something. That's why the Bible says, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Deceiving your own selves. And how many Christians, so-called Christians, deceive their own selves by rejecting this? Because it doesn't make sense. God's strategy is always the right strategy. And he's the only one that can see down the road of your life to know what you're going to need, when you're going to need it. That's why we trust him. And do what he says. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being with us today. I thank you for teaching us. Father, I realize it's not important, that important what I say that matters. It's what you say to each individual in here that matters the most. That, Father, you've given us strategies to win, to overcome, to conquer. But, Father, it, it takes work. It takes effort. So many people today want want things without doing anything. We're consumers. And yet we should be servants. The greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. Help us to be that. Help us to be those people that serve. And if no one ever says a word to us, we know that, God, you're pleased. Help us. Deliver us. Encourage us by your Holy Spirit. And Father, may we purpose to get in the word from this moment on and find out what strategy has God given me for this area of my life, for that area of my life. The Bible teaches us that if we acknowledge God in all our ways, he'll lead and direct our paths. 
and crown our efforts with success. That's one of the things I pray every morning I get up. It's a strategy. God, I acknowledge you in all my life. You said if I acknowledge you in my life today, you would lead and direct my path and crown my efforts with success. I want that in my life. God is a good God. For Father, bless us, help us, heal us, strengthen us in Jesus' name. And God's given us a strategy to go to heaven. It's his heaven. You don't earn it. You don't deserve to go there. None of us do. We go there because we receive a gift. And it's called the gift of salvation. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense that if I pr believe in my heart and confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, I'll be saved from what? Eternal death from hell. Because we're either going to go to heaven or hell. There's no other place to go. And you die. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to do God's strategy. You must be born again. Jesus is the only way. There is no other way. So if you're sitting in here, right at your seat with every head bowed just for a few moments, and you say, preacher, would you include me in your prayer? I need to get it right with God. He's given us a strategy to get right with him called repentance. Repentance is not saying you're sorry. It's changing your thinking, changing your actions. It's being willing to, and it may take you a while to get there, but we keep repenting until we win, until we overcome. And God's good with that. It's his strategy. So for some of us, we need to repent and give our lives back to the Lord and start doing what he asks. For others, we need to give him permission to our life. We need to submit and surrender, as we sang today, we need to surrender our will to his will and just say, God, I don't understand it all because I don't understand it all. But I can read and I can do what you ask even if I don't understand it because it's a strategy to help me overcome the enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy my life. And that's you must be born again. If you're out there today or watching, wherever you're watching, and you say, preacher, would you pray with me? I walked with God, but I walked away. I'm ready to come home. Or preacher, would you pray with me? I'm ready to give Jesus my life. I prayed a prayer here and there, and the reason it hasn't taken is because you really had no desire to change. You just wanted some fire insurance. You wanted hell insurance. Said, man, I don't want to go to hell. But the Bible talks about we make him Lord, then he saves us. If you confess him as your Lord, you'll be saved. You have to submit your will to his, and then he saves you from eternal death. If that's you and you say, preacher, include me in your prayer right where you're seated. Here's all. I just want to know if I'm praying for anybody all over this place. If you say that to me in Jesus' name, would you just lift your hand right where you're seated? Is there anybody here? God bless you. Thank you. God bless 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 you. Thank you so much. I'm going to look across the top if I can see up there. Anybody up there? By the lifting of your hand. It says, preacher, include me in your prayer. I'm ready. I need healing. I need help. Anybody else before we close? Father, thank you. God loves people. Thank you. There's no shame in this or no condemnation. This is how we all come humble. That's the strategy. God says, it's the humble he gives grace to. He's going to give you much grace today. Would you pray this prayer with me if you lifted your hand? And if you didn't and you're already right with God, would you pray this prayer loud with me? Pray with all your heart. Would you pray, Father, I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe he's your son. And he's the only way. So today, I believe that in my heart. And now I willingly confess with my mouth. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for helping me renew my mind to your word. Thank you for helping me overcome and win in this life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's thank God, church. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. All right, those of you that said that prayer, if you'll uh, go ahead and go online, uh, you could go ahead and visit Grow Faith, and you'll be able to get this free ebook that will be downloaded to you, and it now tells you how to walk out your faith and how to grow in relationship with Christ, and that's our free gift to you. Uh, I don't know about you, but I felt like I got a spiritual overhaul today. He was uh, in all areas of our lives. 
And uh, everything he said was absolutely found in God's Word and backed with the Scripture. Here's what I know. A God strategy always challenges your strategy. And it's uncomfortable. Some of the things he said today were uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable. Because God's Word challenges the uncomfortableness of our lives and the air of our lives. And I I just uh, uh, appreciate the fact that he came and pastored us today through the Word of God so that we could truly have victory. And I don't know about you, I thought it was awesome. Amen. Now, he gave us a little bit of a marriage uh, conference today. And you singles, I hope you are plugging your ears because it was not for you to hear, but but it was totally scriptural. Because if you read about David, David went home and took a bath. Then he went to the church. Then he went home and ate. And then he made love to Bathsheba and had a child. So if you thought that he was all over the place and went accurate, go read your Bible. It says David went and took a bath. He went and he worshiped God. And then he fed his stomach that he could enjoy his wife. That's, that's three good things there, right there. I just helped some people on their mar- marriage conference right now. Amen. Hey, uh, don't forget, this Sunday, we're a healing service, a miracle service. Why don't you reach out to someone that's sick? I'm believing God that he is going to heal people this Sunday, whether that's online or whether that's in the building. How many of you know there's a lot of people suffering physically, mentally, and emotionally? with all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. And we're going to believe God for some incredible miracles to take place this Sunday. So I want to ask you to come believing, come expecting that God is truly going to do something. If you need any additional prayer, you're going to go into our chapel over here, and there will be people that will agree with you and pray with you. Father, I just pray your blessings upon people for the rest of this week. As they go into their highways and their byways, protect them from hurt, harm, and danger. I pray no sickness or disease will come upon them. I pray, Lord, today, pray for our children and our grandchildren, God. Watch over them. This world is a sinful, wayward, demonic world, oh God. Help us to do our part, oh God, to not allow that world to creep into their lives. But you minister to their to minister to them, O oh God. Let them have true visitations with you, O oh God. And I thank you in the name of Jesus that they are called, anointed, and separated from this world, O oh God. And I thank you for protecting and watching over them. Separate them from bad influences, O oh God. Bring righteous friends into their lives. Don't let them get caught up in the, the social media of the world, O oh God, that will take them down a path, O oh God, that's not of you. Give them great conscience. Give them great discernment. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We'll see you when we see you.